morning and welcome to Morning Buzz. I'm Adam Eisen, membership director of the One Club for Creativity and your host. It's Thursday, day four of Creative Week. Let's hear it for Creative Week. We had a great time celebrating the best of design last night at the ADC Awards. We had so much fun. Kevin did some aerial dancing for us. How are you feeling today, Kevin? Uh, in all seriousness, it was a great time, and congratulations to all of our winners. Let's hear it for them one more time. Just to make sure you're not sleeping on me, today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Later in the episode, the Weber Shandwick Collective will present recent findings from the Earned Effect Study, which is sure to excite and motivate our advertising community. But first, since everybody loves my interviews, I'm going to sit down with two faculty members of One School. One School was launched in 2021 as a solution to the glaring diversity problem in the advertising industry. Despite uh, be benefiting from black culture, black creatives are few and far between. Yes, there's systemic bias in the hiring process, but more problematic are the barriers to ent entry with the cost of two years of, at top portfolio schools costing up to $40,000. So, the creative development team here at the One Club for Creativity, along with Oriel Davis Lyons, teamed up to launch a free 16-week virtual portfolio program for black creatives. But more than just building a book, graduates walk away as part of a dynamic network of black creatives supporting each other's growth in the industry. To date, one school has graduated 154 students and boasts an 84% higher rate, 66% of whom are women. Let's hear it for that. With four schools here in the US and the UK just launching this year in partnership with WPP, one school is on a great path to success. With me today are two faculty members of one school to talk about the program. Our first is Sergio Claudio, head of mentorship of One School and former vice president of brand and, uh, and sorry, former vice president of brand and creative at Zora. Sergio is a global creative and technology ex executive with over 20 years of experience building high performance creative, product, and marketing teams for agencies, consumer brands, and global tech companies. A designer by trade, his storied career spans across in-house studios and external agencies, driving brand marketing, award-winning ad campaigns, innovative digital experiences, and global experiential events for companies like Adobe, Disney, Apple, Ford, VW, Paramount, and many more. While his diverse experience in marketing, creative, and technology has helped global brands build award-winning work, he also invests his time in building future world-class creative leaders through his work as a mentor and advisor in one school and speaking at top, with students at top design and advertising in institutions around the country. Let's hear it for him one more time. Thank you, thank you. Joining Sergio is Ramon Ariel de los Santos, one school's New York tutor and creative <laughs> Ramon is an award-winning copywriter and art director, born in the Dominican Republic and raised in Harlem. You. He, yep. <laughs> he likes to create work that taps into human insights and grabs people's attention. He has worked at, with prestigious agencies, including VML Y&R, Red Fuse, Hill Holiday, and The Clever Agency, creating works for clients such as Planet Fitness, Colgate, Dunkin' Donuts, Timex, Wendy's, and Paramount. He's also served in-house with Converse and REI and is creative director at 160 over 90 with Target, Meta, Invesco, QQQ, and Timberland as a few of his clients. Ramon was voted most likely to make you laugh by all of his friends, especially that one time he ripped his pants while twerking at a wedding, which he famously defends. It's not my fault, but they played Beyonce. It really is. It really is. <laughs> Really Thank you both for being here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we just listed out your incredible resumes, but let's take it back a bit. Both of you have partially credited your success to early luck and chance. Can both of you share about one of these lucky moments that set you on a path to success that you have today? One moment that was pretty sort of extraordinary for me was when I received my scholarship to School of Visual Arts. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it wasn't a, a scholarship I applied for. It was a program that I was a part of through my high school. I was going to Hunter College. There was a gallery show with our work from the summer and the president of the school was there. Everyone told him, hey, this kid got into SVA, couldn't afford it. By the end of the night, we're talking. He's like, if I give you this amount of money per semester, it was like the perfect amount. Would you be able to afford it? I'm like, uh, uh, yeah. I cried on the train home. And from there, it, you know, it's all history, right? I mean, here I am now. Um, but, you know, credit to the one school, right? Like, I had to go through these extraordinary circumstances to get a chance of getting into this industry and building a portfolio that showed the value of my work and my creativity. Uh, so yeah, that was that was my little sort of lucky break moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you? Awesome. You know, I um, <clears throat> I had a different story in mind, but hearing that story, you know, I think it's just the lucky moment for me was really a learning opportunity. I was at uh, Temple University. Um, there's a sort of central gathering area called the Bell Tower. And there was a student event, uh, you know, just people signing up for organizations. And I met someone there and they said, oh, you know, what are you studying? I said, design. They were like, oh, you want to be a designer? I said, yeah. And so they said, you know, okay, so do you know Photoshop? Do you know Cold Fusion? Do you know this? Do you know that? And I was just like flabbergasted. So I just started writing everything down and started going and doing my research. And that person happened to be the person that gave me my first job. And so that person ended up hiring me to do um, uh, designs for concerts and record promo and I ended up through him getting a gig with Epic Records doing uh, uh, music flyers and, and uh, record signing posters for Tower Records um, out of Philadelphia. Some would say that the creative industry can be a bit competitive. The One Club is built on competitions after all. <laughs> what made the two of you inclined to want to give back and support new talent? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, I, I, I credit a lot of the opportunity that I've had to the chance encounters like we just shared. And so I was fortunate enough to meet great people along the way that were able to help steer me in the right direction, but it wasn't necessarily laid out. You know, it was a very, um, you know, nonlinear journey and, and having to just raise my hand and show up for opportunities and tr constantly try and, you know, fight for my seat at the table. And you know, at any point in my career, none of those people ever really looked like me, came from where I came from, understood my influences or my background. And so when I'd seen that Oriel and, and team started posting about one school, um, you know, and, and, and that uh, getting kicked off soon, for me, it was just very inspiring. It was like, wow, that seems like the answer to everything I wish I had when I was just starting out. And how do I get in? And so I was very fortunate to be able to connect with Oriel and Bob and Tony and several people. And, and, you know, just find a way during my time at Adobe to get involved as a sponsor and then also as a mentor to really share these stories and these lessons to help people build their careers. Yeah, for me, it was, um, you know, you, as you progress in your career, you start to sort of wonder and figure out, all right, what can I do to be a part of a solution, right? Like, we all had that reckoning. We've all been through COVID and, and all that. But even before that, trying to figure out, all right, how do I contribute, right? Like, I'm not one that it's going to show up in the front of the march. That's just not my energy. But I want to help progress and push things forward. And, you know, I was thinking about teaching and, and it sort of stars aligned in a way where, where, you know, I saw, I reached out to Oriel. He posted about it recently and I'm like, oh, this is the way. Like, I know what this industry has done for me, a little Mandalorian <laughs> reference. Um, this is so, the way. <laughs> This is the way. Uh, and so it, it just made sense for me where I'm like, okay, I can teach you the skills that I've learned because I've had so many great teachers and, and I've encountered in my career and I have a tangible sort of impact where people change their lives and their families' lives if, you know, by just helping them realize that this is an industry where they belong in and where they can prosper. So, yeah, that's well, Awesome. Maybe. Sergio, you've... Uh proclaimed yourself the proud uncle of one school, given your early involvement. As you found yourself in the position of mentor and now mentor of mentors, what's something you've gained from your experience that you may not have anticipated when you set in? Yeah, I've got to say, um, you know, just a little story behind that. I, I, I tell people if, if Oriel and Ez and the team are sort of the founding fathers and the founding folks of one school, 
I've always, I've always been that proud uncle just cheering on the program, cheering on the students, you know, giving what I can in terms of time or, you know, sponsorship support. Um, and, you know, I think there's a couple things. One, you know, this started as an opportunity for me to give back, as you said, right? You know, what is the role that you're going to play in helping people, you know, progress and open doors? You know, what was surprising for me was how much I get back from the students, right? And being able to have just a front row seat to, you know, the youngest and, and freshest creative minds and how they think and how they address problems and the influences that they're borrowing from. You know, I found out about Clubhouse from mentors, I mean, from the mentees. I found out about, you know, different types of influencers. I found out about different types of performance pieces. You know, so for me, it's just a con it's an opportunity to have just a gateway into new creativity, new ideas, while also just being able to connect with the community, right? I think, um, you know, one other thing I'll share is just that it's not only the, men the relationship with the mentor and the mentee, but then the community of one school as a whole, right? The students, the alumni, the mentors that come in. And I would say when we, you know, when we kicked off the mentor program last fall, it was immediately obvious. I went from not only being connected to 30 students, but now 30 mentors who are out in the industry that are trying to find a way to get, give back and get engaged with the community. It's incredible. Uh, Ramon, this is your first semester as a teacher. Uh, what are you learning so far? I'm learning, I'm noticing sort of the parallels between teaching yoga and teaching creativity. You know, like you have to create a space that, that feels safe, that feels vulnerable and open. And you have to be willing to be open and vulnerable about what you don't know. And, and really be able to share that and, and say, and just call it out, right? So that they can sort of model that. Like, oh, I, I actually don't know. Like, I just have a, a hunch and because of this and that and, and, um, and how much I'm getting back from it in terms of talking about ideas for hours, right? Like, it, it feels like a resharpening of your tools and, and, and really refocusing and, and a reminder of why you fell in love with, with this industry and this sort of, work you know as a creative problem solver so you know if i can share one more thing um i think the other surprising thing as a mentor is that it almost feels like the students become an extension of your team so as a creative leader at a company you know you're always nurturing you're developing talent well that is now extending to this broader com community of aspirational creatives so it feels like you know these mentees that i've been working with since they were students they've now gone into their careers and they're at Ogilvy and they're at Apple and they're at all these other companies and we still feel like part of the same team. Talking them through, you know, job dynamics, professional dynamics, presentation skills. So, and it's been really rewarding in that aspect as well. I also liked in our, our introductory call, we, we talked a bit about this question and Ramon, you had mentioned that you were in this process almost confirming what you knew. You were like, I, I, I'm almost like, the best way to learn is to teach. Uh, and I thought right. that was really cool. Right. Uh, in my mind, I'm like, I don't know shit. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm still trying to figure this out. And it, it, you're like, oh, wait, actually, I, okay, that hunch I had wasn't totally off or wrong. And yeah. like, okay, I, I, can, I can tell what a good idea is. All right. It's like sort of affirmations for yourself as you put it into practice, right? Because if you, if you don't put it into practice, like with martial arts, you're like, Am I still a martial artist? I don't know. But then you go in front of a heavy bag and you're like, oh shit, I can still kick. All right. Oh, this still, all right, this this move is coming through. All right, okay, I'm okay. I'm, I can yeah. totally relate to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I just think it's awesome because here at the One Club we're all about career development and I work a lot with uh, young creatives who are stepping up, they're taking on some mentorship roles in our mentor and creative program. And I think that's just a really good reminder that you just kind of have to put yourself out there and do it and through that process confirm what you know and what you have to offer. Yes. Uh, we're almost three years out from the murder of George Floyd, which was a catalyst for companies to pledge they would do better and hire more diversely. There's obviously still a lot of work to do and many notice that there seems to be a deceleration in these efforts. So now that there's been some time to identify some specific solutions and pinpoint problem areas, do either of you have any suggestions on how agencies might retool or rethink hiring and reignite efforts behind hiring diversely? Yeah, you know, I think um, as, I've, as I've thought a lot about sort of 
three years since the beginning of one school, three years since the the um, the movement. It, it's it's been a, I've become more aware that programs like one school and programs like ours, you know, we're planting seeds for the long game, right? This is a problem that's existed at the entry level, at the mid level, at the senior level, at the executive level. And where we are today and now seeing the growth of these careers, right? We have people who are now been in the industry for two or three years, but they're just now getting to this next level of leadership. You know, when we get to certain, you know, uh, programs and events where you're at these award shows and you know, we know that we're putting more talent into the industry, but the talent that we see on stage receiving the awards still looks like the old school, right? It shows that we still have more work to do. And so I think there's an opportunity for breakthroughs to start happening at the more senior levels, right? We can keep doing what we're doing here at one school, but, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, our, our, our students coming back and becoming tutors and our students coming back and becoming mentors and sharpening their skills and becoming leaders and getting those opportunities, it's going to be one way to do it. But then, you know, mentorship and resources for those more seniors and those executives and that career development so that they're the ones that are not only, they're not, you don't see diversity in just the people presenting the award, you see diversity in the people receiving and celebrating the awards. Yeah, I think, you know, change is slow, but, and, and it takes time, but that shouldn't lead to sort of apathy and inaction. Um, and it, it starts with, you know, just when you look at a problem that's this large, you can sometimes feel overwhelmed. So, you know, things like the one school are a singular action. It's like, let's just focus on one part of the problem and sort of I think start a chain effect. So with agencies and even brand side, you know, don't try to sort of boil the ocean as some creatives say, like just take an action, like talk to your recruiters and have them sort push for diverse candidates. Um, you know, then look, examine your organization and see if it is a place where uh, diverse talent can thrive and, and not just be a, a number on, on the diversity chart or on your about me page, right? Like create the environment for growth. It's no different uh, from anybody else, it's human. Um, and just, you know, allow people to show up as their authentic selves. And, and don't be surprised when it's different from your experience, which, you know, that kind of thing. So I think you just gotta keep, keep going and realize it's a marathon. Yeah. I also, uh, sorry to jump in, but I also liked in our call, we, um... You, uh, Sergio, you had mentioned this, this strategy behind the world is now much more remote. We're working from home over Zoom. We're able to hire people from wherever. And that this creates a lot of opportunities. Much as the one school meets people where they're at by being a virtual program, agencies could adopt a similar method when looking for talent. Yeah, yeah. No, I, thanks for bringing that up. I think it's important to talk about the solutions as much as we, you know, bring awareness to the problem. And I think, um, you know, I was just going to say 216 degrees is how you boil the ocean. And <laughs> it's just, and, and I say that, you know, I did a presentation because a lot of times people use things like that. Like, oh, the problem's too big. We'll never be able to solve it. Right. But if you find the number, if you find the goal, you can start to make a dent in the problem. And so, you know, to your point, you know, hiring strategy. That's one of the things that, you know, I was having a conversation about some of the systemic challenges of being able to become more diverse relate to where people are hiring their roles, right? You know, continuing to hire tech roles out of San Francisco and tech hubs means you're always going to get the same type of candidates coming from the same types of schools with the same types of expectations. But the pandemic and, you know, again, the model of the one school has offered opportunity to people wherever they are right, which means that now you can start to source that creativity from different types of hubs, from Atlanta, from Tennessee, from Austin, from, you know, Detroit, Oklahoma, Erie, Pennsylvania, right? People that didn't have access to those opportunities before have access when companies start to open their policies and start to really make space for, you know, someone to live in a different location or someone to come from a different background but has more experience. And so that's where I've seen a lot of success. Um, you know, and I would also say, you know, we talked about the awards. You know, one of the things just, you know, not to do a shameless plug, but, you know, seeing the, the One Club introduce the Fusion Pencil, the Fusion Cube, right? It puts the onus back on the teams to say, hey, if you want to qualify for these opportunities, 
you have to start meeting us at the bottom line, right? Your teams have to be diverse. Your creative leaders have to be diverse. The, the cast, the work that you do has to be diverse. And so those are the things that you have enough of them, you'll get to that 216 degrees. Absolutely. On the lighter side, can you each share a story, the more embarrassing the better, <laughs> of a mistake you made early on in your career that can help people uh, here today, help them avoid? Um. I don't know how helpful this would be, but my <laughs> most embarrassing moment came at my very first day in advertising at formerly known as Y&R before the VML uh, part. Um, it was Bagel Monday. I was wearing all black like I am today, and I was a little late to Bagel Monday. I had a bagel and I threw up on myself um, all over my pants on my first day. It was I was down bad. but. I'm like, okay, this is about as worse as it can get. Set I think I can, I, let's, let's set the ball real low. Let's take a step up now. Let's, you know, I hope it's not all throwing up on myself, uh, out of out of just you know the the jitters and and, and nervousness of just being there. Uh, so yeah. So you too can throw up on yourself the first day of work <laughs> and do okay. <laughs> yes. You know, I'll share two. One really small but uh i went all out one year for the halloween contest at our agency and i went head to toe you know jack nicholson style joker um you know green hair like a just purple jacket i was just i was i was down to win that concert or did that that contest but then i didn't know that we had a meeting with a potential partner that same day so i walked into the room with everyone that didn't go as hard and, you know, an external partner dressed as the Joker <laughs> and had to conduct the entire meeting as the Joker. So let's just say I tried to really overcompensate through with like my data and numbers just to show that I really belong there. <laughs> He's committed. You, you bring out the deep stories, man. <laughs> it's the yoga instructor in me. I would say the other one is just learning from a mistake, right? Um, you know, in the early days of ad tech and digital advertising, it was like super manual to do, you know, 73 ads for Ford, um, you know, in all the different markets. And that created a lot of room for human error. And I was the human that made the errors. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, we were a, a partner of Team Detroit. Um, you know, I got the assignment at like 3 p.m. on a Friday, you know, banged it out for throughout the weekend and then, you know, showed up on Monday and got chewed out by uh, uh, the CD at the time because it was like the bounce was off on the tires and all that. And so got the email from the CEO of the company, the head of operations, Ford was our biggest customer. They were like, you know, you're someone that's got great potential, but, you know, so we also have to tell you when you really messed up. And this is one of those. Um, you know, but that also then gave me the opportunity to fix it. And that actually became my entry into leadership because I had accountability, but the process was also accountable and all that. So I was like, I won't let this happen again. And so turn that failure into opportunity. That's the only way to really learn is you make those mistakes. You're super embarrassed and you learn not to make that in the future. I've been there so many times. <laughs> Uh, Sergio, as a mentor, if you could impart one piece of wisdom to your mentees, what would it be? I'd say my favorite thing, um, just through my experience, is always be willing to do the job that other people don't want to do. You know, I feel like um, I've often just found times where I hear so many people saying, oh, I don't want to do that, or oh, you don't want to be around that person, or oh, you don't want to do that. And it's actually made me curious. You know, and I've said later at this stage, it's like when I see everyone going right, I go left or the other way around for whichever you're sitting. But, um, you know, it's just you go and you find opportunity in places that people aren't looking. And that often happens by doing the job that other people around you don't want to do. Uh, Ramon, after 16 weeks, if a student learns one thing, what would you hope that that is? Um, they would say uh, no QR codes. QR codes are not an idea. <laughs> they make jokes about that. Um, I think they will learn that everything is an opportunity, right? Like there's there's always a pivot or a move there. For there's there's always a potential opportunity and to keep digging and be open to. 
different ideas. Awesome. Beautiful. Let's get the audience in on this. Do we have any questions from our audience? Yes. Uh, we, you just have to speak up, and I'll repeat it into the mic. We're short on mics today. Yeah. Well, first of all, Gabriella, the uh, director of the One Show, says hola. Hola, from Gabriela. Hello, Gabriela. She also agrees that the best way to learn is to teach. Mm -hmm. So, great topic. Um, I was just curious, you know, the um, emergence of artificial intelligence, AI, is now on the scene, affecting, of course, the career trajectory of, of uh, art directors, copywriters, etc. How is that? How are you incorporating that into the one school curriculum? How are the students perceiving AI into their workflow now? So for our folks at home, a question is about AI and how our tutors are incorporating that into the one school curriculum. I mean, we talk about it openly and the way I speak about it is that it's a new tool, right? Like don't see it as a, you know, as an enemy or as a threat because I don't think that uh, a, a machine can do your job or find the into, it, it can only give you what you input. Um, it, it doesn't see around the corners the way you could with your intuition. And so I ask them to use it as a tool, any like Photoshop, right? I'm pretty sure when Photoshop was created, uh, people, the illustrators who made the storyboards all were really worried, like this is going to take our jobs, but guess what? We have still have illustrators who make storyboards. They just use Photoshop instead of a colored pencil, you know? Um, so I, I think we have to see it that way. Um, I would imagine it's the same fear that we had when TV came around and we were like, well, who's going to watch that? We Radio, we're done. Radio's dead or print is dead. Like, we still love print. We still have radio. We just find new and innovative ways to do it. Uh, and, and I think, and that's what I, I like to teach them, right? Like, like I said earlier, everything's an opportunity. Look at it as a tool. Look at it as a way. How can I use this for my client? How can I adapt it? How can I make something cool with it? And you know, hope that the scientists didn't open Pandora's box to the point that we will be an I am legend, you know, <laughs> or Terminator, or, or Terminator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, no, I, I think you, you you said it you know perfectly, which is you know, in every major evolution, there's always been this fear, right? And that fear is the fastest way to sink your career. I think. You know, on the you know, you had Photoshop come out and the age of digital publishing and people became anti digital, right? You had the purist, you had people that were like, Oh, I'm only gonna focus on this medium, I'm going to ignore digital. Then they started to ignore social media. Then they started to ignore, you know, websites and platforms, and probably the other way around. Um, you know, but the the the, the the role of being successful in this and you know it, it, it's to approach these things fearlessly right they are tools they're things to help you make things better right i remember the steve jobs interview where he talked about the computer being a bicycle for the mind right it's something that helps you go further in your career and in the work that you do you know thankfully with the students in one school we don't i haven't had to teach them that they come to the table with it they come to the table with the curiosity about AI. They come to the table with the curiosity about VR and AR. And so, you know, if the, pre if the pre uh, preceding generation were digital natives, you know, these creators, they're creator natives, they're AI natives, they're coming to the table with this blend of skills that I don't think the older hat generation of creative leaders are necessarily ready for. But it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting to see that disruption. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions from our in-house audience? There we go. Our resident question asker, Brett McKenzie. <laughs> uh, morning, guys. Um, back when one school launched, I know a lot of industry veterans or older people, myself included, said, man, I wish we had that when I was breaking into the industry. But now that you've gone through this a few, uh, a few years, do you find that perhaps maybe this would not have worked when we were younger, 10, mm -hmm. 15, 20 years ago? Was this the moment for this particular idea right now? This is the time? Or could it have been any time? Could it have been the 80s, 70s? So less eloquently for our audience at home, the question is, would the concept of the one school have worked earlier and uh, been an option for, for folks looking for something like it maybe a decade or so ago? <clears throat> You know, I think uh, I think at the root of one school is sort of the old saying, each one teach one, right? 
you know, I think people have always had an opportunity to give back and to reinvest in, in the community and people around them and pull people forward, right? Open the door. I think, you know, what is unique about one school is that it leveraged, it, you know, just to get technical, the digital adoption that happened in 2020. Everyone now had access to Zoom. Everyone now had, you know, not everyone, but, you know, more people had access. More people were using this as their behavior. More people got used to having conversations virtually and across distances and across time zones. And so I think that's one of the things that keeps one school thriving is that the technology today has enabled it to be more successful and has continued to enable it to grow. And then when you have social media, I mean, how many times have we mentioned someone made a post on LinkedIn? Right, you know, you you po you see these these grads that are making posts and sharing the careers that they got into, and now people are interested. So I think that's also what's fueling it is that you know every time that we someone graduates, every time that someone joins, there's this amplification effect that happens today that couldn't have happened in the 80s or the 70s that I think is helping fuel the growth of one school. Awesome. I think that was a great question to uh, to land on. So Sergio, Ramon, uh, I looked at you in the opposite order and I apologize. Uh, thank you so much for being here, but more so, thank you for your con contributions to the One School. Thank you so much. Let's thank hear you. it for Sergio. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On the mic. For our next segment, we'll get some hard facts that will help creatives sell work that truly makes an impact. So Please welcome Nigel Ramvor, Head of Strategy and Analytics at Weber Shandwick, Germany, and Joy farber Colo, Global Chief Brand Officer at the Weber Shandwick Collective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I do want to say I think um, the clicker is slow, and I talk really fast, Hello. so we may be uh, a little off kilter. So we are from Weber Shandwick. Um, we are one of the, the biggest communications firms in the world. And I'm saying that because when I say we believe that earned first brand building is the highest bar, um, that is not a shocker. So what we did set out to do, though, is go beyond um, whether it's experience or point of view or opinions and feelings and get to facts. So we did a study with the IPA called the Earned Effect Study to look at the impact of campaigns and brands that earn coverage and conversation on business. And here's a spoiler alert. Um, campaigns that earn coverage and conversation drive a dramatically disproportionate impact on brand metrics, transformative business impact. Um, now, what's been interesting to us as we share with clients, give them an early look at this data, is you know, in some ways for us, it's quite intuitive. They're, they're incredibly excited by it. And that clients on the marketing side of the house, as well as the communication side of the house. So the question becomes why? Because it, in many ways, it's harder than ever to be a marketer or an advertiser or in creative or, or create things that break through. So why is that? So here's our starting point. Our starting point is people don't wake up in the morning thinking, I wonder, what brand X did or company Y. They, they just, in fact, according to the Harvard Business Review last year, let's see if this goes, there was an article last year that said 77% of consumers claim to have literally no relationship with brands. And, and who can blame them? Because we're all living in this world, absolute radical complexity. And I don't have to go through the stuff on this list because we all know it and we all live it and we all endure it. And everything is converging. Brands, consumer, media, technology, policy are all converging. And at the same time, media is fragmenting. So where we used to have top-down influence, we have networks of influence, literally the proliferation of platforms where there's just tons of content being created daily. So you can say the average person is scrolling through more than 300 feet of content. So only topped here by Big Ben, or um, the literal amount of content they are paying, paying to avoid. So the absolute work that we're spending our time to create, they are paying to block out. So you say, okay, so I have all this complexity, the world has gone insane, I have overload, I am literally being drowned out with content, media is fragmenting into all different places, and there is a starting point of apathy, I just don't care. So then we go back to, okay, earned, building for earned, briefing for earned, 
orchestrating for earned. It's not a risky decision. It's not a, should I go this way? It's a new decision. From our perspective, again, it is, it is the must decision, and it is the must decision for this moment. Um, and it's an incredibly smart business decision. So now Nigel's gonna take you into our earned effect study, um, which we're pretty excited about. And as we go through it, I'm gonna point out for you some of the slides that marketing leaders are really honing in on um, to take and to sort of sell, I think in many ways, the incredible importance of what everybody in this room spends their time wanting to do, which is build really powerful, meaningful brands and campaigns, and that performance marketing has its place, but it's a place that is supportive of big ideas worthy of earning, um, not out front of those. So you wanna take it away, Nigel? Absolutely. Hey guys, pleasure. Um, yeah, I think this this study is going to give you is going to give our industry um, the line of argumentation we need um, to sell in great work. And um, what we have done is we, as Joy said, we wanted to understand the impact of earned communications on business performance through hard market data like profitability, like market share, like sales, and so forth. And to that end, we partnered with the best partner we could find in the business, and that's the IPA in London. Um, the IPA has been around for 100 years, and they are, they, are, they are a global and highly recognized authority in marketing communications. Um, over 40 years of data, over 1,500 case studies analyzed, over 80 product categories, global, B2B, and B2C. And they are known for the most rigorous award scheme that there is in, in the world of effectiveness. Um, so winning an IPA award is not a small feat. It's a really big deal. Um, your work is diced and sliced um, by expert judges, and um, the rigor that goes into that is crazy. Um, they are known for landmark studies like the long and the short of it by Peter Field and Les Binet, and you will hear a little bit about Peter later because we partnered with Peter on this. So this is great. Um, now, about our study, the earned effect study, what we did was we looked at 340 campaigns um, and the analysis period was 2010 to 2020 because that's when um, social really took off. And global B2B, B2C across 60 product categories and um, all of the um, cases in this were award entrants or winners of the IPA effectiveness competition. So we are sourcing from a really good pool of work. And the analysis was conducted independently by Peter Field and Ed Elworthy from the IPA. Okay, cool. Next slide. Some of the brands. Next slide. One note on those brands though. Consumer brands and B2B brands. So the place for creativity and earn first creativity, I think it, it underscores the relevance across the board. So we had two main research groups. One of them, the first one is the culturally salient group. These are campaigns that earned coverage and earned conversation over the long term, approximately nine months. And then there was a group we called non-culturally salient. Those were campaigns that neither earned coverage nor conversation, right? So one earns, com um, the, the culturally salient group earns coverage and conversation over a long term and the other group does not earn coverage or conversation. Um, and we are not including trait publications like Adweek and that sort of stuff, right? That's not included. That's not part of it. So you got you to gotta go beyond that. Now, that being said, there is a group of campaigns that falls in between, obviously. And this group we called Other. And they earned coverage or conversation, but not both. And when they earned um, both, they only did so for a short period of time, OK? So um, can we go to the here? No, the next slide, please. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, here's a quote from Peter. Um, and um, again, he is, the, he is an independent con consultant for the IPA and the author of the long and short of it. And he says, culturally salient campaigns are a type of fame campaign. And we have long known that fame campaigns are especially effective. So we expected positive findings in this study. In fact, culturally salient campaigns, those that earn coverage and conversation over the long term, strongly outperform the wider fame group across most business metrics, showing them to be truly the best of the best. 
Um, so let's go to the next one. So th this is our headline, right? So 53% more likely to drive very large business effects, 2.6 times more likely to drive large profit growth. Um, and it, again, Nigel's gonna go into the, the detail on that. But if you, um, this, is the, this is the slide that a lot of clients are stealing and taking and putting into their presentations. Yeah, so um, when we go to the, it, it's hard, right? We're gonna keep. <laughs> we keep doing it. Um, perfect, so, all right. In the yellow is a group of campaigns called culturally salient that earn coverage and conversation over the long term. And in the dark yellow, you see the group of campaigns that don't earn coverage or in conversation. Um, so that's the non-cultural selling group. And when we go all the way to the left to profit, we see that 40% of the campaigns that earn coverage and conversation over the long term report very large profit growth, 40% versus 15% of the group of campaigns that don't earn coverage and don't earn conversation. So what you have here is a hundred. 67% improvement, meaning uplift. Now, when, as we, when, and, and these effects, I mean, you see that across the board, when brands earn coverage and conversation over the long term, they outperform on sales gain, um, 57% versus 40%. So that's a 43% uplift. And on market share, look at market share, that's 40% versus 19%. So that's 111% improvement when campaigns earn coverage and conversation over the long term. That's really good. That's the type of work that we are all shooting for, right? That's the iconic work we want. Now, let's go to the next page. Um, and they also outperform other IPA campaigns on these key business metrics such as profit, sales gain, and market share gain. And the other ones, what I mean by that is, remember those campaigns when I said they earned coverage or conversation but not both? And when they earned both, they only did so for a short period of time. Those are the ones in gray. They fall right in between, but they are being outperformed by the yellow, meaning the campaigns that earn coverage and conversation over the long term. Right? So on profit, on sales gains, on market share gain, completely outperformed. Let's go to the next page. They are also more likely to generate a halo effect, uplifting other products in the franchise. So um, when I say halo, um, um, think of it as you're advertising Johnny Walker Black, but you're also uplifting the sales of Johnny Walker Red, blue, white, green, whatever there is. <laughs> no, they all really exist, you know? Um, and, um, and that's amazing. So that's a really, really, really strong impact for the type of work that we all value. Um, let's go to the next page. And they outperform on key brand health metrics. So on brand image, for example, look at that stark difference there, 47 versus 23%. Um, but also on other things like differentiation, trust, esteem, which means quality and commitment. Um, so awareness, obviously, the yeah, this the outperform on all key brand health metrics. Let's go to the next page, and this is an interesting chart, right? I mean, so they all make omni-channel investments. We all need omni-channel investments to to make it. Obviously, that's important, but they place more of an emphasis um, um, on earned media, on social and digital, um, and. Let's have a look at, at the earned media, for example. They invest twice as much in earned media. And <clears throat> as I said, they over-index in social and in digital. But let's have a look at search, at paid search, right there in the middle. 41 versus 67%, which means they use paid search a lot, a lot less, a lot less. And that's really interesting because obviously when you are a campaign, when, when you have a campaign that earns coverage and conversation over the long term and you know, people start looking for you on their own, they start searching for you on their own. So you don't have to pay people to search for you, which is absurd in a way, right? So um, that's really interesting. Next page, please. And they achieve these um, outstanding business results with a moderate budget dis disadvantage. So basically, the, what you see here is that 
um, the average excess share of voice. And in order to grow, brands need to spend ahead of their market share. However, what you see here is that the group of campaigns that earn coverage and conversation over the long term spends less ahead of the market share, but earns much bigger returns in terms of profit, market share, sales, halo, et cetera, everything that we've seen earlier. So you get more with less, actually, and that's really interesting. Next page. And so what you have here on the left-hand side are the short-term objectives, and what you have here on the right-hand side are the short-term effects. And what you see is, is basically that the group of campaigns that earns coverage and conversation over the long term um, focuses more on long-term objectives, yet achieves almost the same short-term effects. So focusing on the long-term does not come at the expense of short-term effects. In other words, building your brand, having a strong brand, um, makes your performance marketing work a lot better and harder. And this is a one. This is one that our clients are taking. Again, our clients responsible for brand equity, for brand building, um, for you know that balance and the push toward you know balancing that push toward performance marketing. They're pulling this one and using it. Yeah. And what else? Oh, yeah. Of course, <laughs> ROI, return on investment, big thing, obviously. And. Um, Remember I said these are all award, award winners and entrants to the IPA effectiveness competition, so we are sourcing from a really, really good um, pool of, of campaigns. And you see that here. The group of campaigns that did not earn coverage and conversation actually achieved a pretty good ROI of 282%. That's a pretty good ROI, ladies and gentlemen. It's just that the group of campaigns that earn coverage and conversation over the long term, called culturally salient, achieves a better ROI of almost 400%. So that's a 400, uh, sorry, that's a 42% improvement. So they are more efficient. In other words, you know, we are uh, this creating work that earns conversation, that earns coverage, and does that over the long term is not risky. That is the safest. That is the safest work you can do. That is the best investment you can do. And this is interesting because they achieve these amazing results under the toughest market conditions. 78% of the campaigns were in either declining, stagnant, or low growth markets. And that is very relevant for today, right? I mean, when we look at the market environment that we are in, um, so I think this has huge relevance, and one of the things that you also should consider is how would these campaigns, how, how would they have done under great market conditions, under prosperous market conditions? So, um, yeah, that's it. Okay, so this is the beating a dead horse slide, which says um, we've gone through it, and, and sort of the core point here being that campaigns that earn coverage, that earn conversation, they are indeed the creme de la creme. The, they're the most efficient, they're the most effective, they're superior in the toughest of times, whether that's macroeconomic conditions or declining category. But then I think the question is, okay, of course, but how do we build campaigns that earn coverage and conversation, especially against the backdrop of the complexities that we discussed of the media fragmentation? So as we look ahead, what, how we think about it is you have to, you have to brief for earned. Um, and as we, we can go to the next slide, you have, to, you have to brief for it, you have to build for it, and engineer for it. So I want to take a second on this. You know, an earned at the core idea. Is the idea, is it true, is it authentic? Is it an idea that is sort of, artif is it an artificial from the brand, uh, the marketing side, the advertising side, where, you know, the client sees their brand through the lens of only potentially sort of like, the artificial world they've created, or are we thinking about it of in the wild, right? How is that authentic earned the core idea based on what's really going on in the world? Are we briefing to build first and earned at the core idea and then thinking about how that is expressed in 
gorgeous and wonderful and, and scroll stopping advertising, how it's choreographed. We talk a lot about choreographing communications, especially when it is so hard um, to break out into the world today. And, and one of the key things as we think about building for earn and really winning an earn is not asking the question of who will you, who will you reach, but who will you activate? What community, because, because media has become a collection of digital communities, who is this for? Who is gonna stand up and talk about it and celebrate it and advocate for it? So it all comes back to, again, that we've said over and over, if, if you wanna win, um, it, it pays literally to earn. And that is our end, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Do have a couple of questions for our presenters. So these results are astonishing. They're wonderful. What's driving these results? Well, I mean, hello, hello. Yeah, you can still hear me. <laughs> um, well, I guess, you know, it's a couple of things. On the one hand, when you, the group of campaigns that earns coverage and conversation over the long term, they have broadly targeted sales and market share objectives versus tightly targeted uh, customer acquisition and um, retention goals. So that's, that's, that's a huge difference there. They also focus on salience. They also focus very strongly on brand image. Um, and they also uh, focus more on the long term than just, and yet achieve, as we saw, right, the same short term effects almost, right? So there are, uh, yeah, that's kind of like it. I mean, from the study, what we see, and obviously all the work that, that, that was, I mean, we looked at the work obviously, but all of the work was either, you know, that people were tapping into our cultural attention, for example, or they were tapping into our cultural opportunity. And uh, and that simply led to work that went above the category category um, limitations and reached a lot of people. I mean, I, I think the question is, and again, this is what we all live and breathe and try to do every day: is how do you create work that um, adds something, adds some value to a real conversation or a real community, so it encourages them to sort of take your brand, take your campaign, and make it their own and bring it forward. Um, so I think, I, and I think what's really important as we look at this research is this was 2010 to 2020. Think about if it were now. Again, we were talking about creators earlier and the need to sort of create brands that you can open up and sort of share your brand with the creator community. I think, I think this research would look even more sort of astronomically, you know, when we look at that omni omnichannel chart, that's another chart that um, marketing leaders inside organizations are taking forward to say, look, we need really multi-dimensional work. And so you, you, you spoke to the, the fact that work that seems to be addressing conversations now, issues now, really seem to rise to the cream of the crop. When you look at the study, does it break it all out at all in terms of different mediums or topics? Or is there any way to kind of see what type of earned uh, perform the best? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's basically, it's a range of topics, to be quite honest, right? I mean, it, it can go from, as I mentioned, right, tapping into a cultural tension, starting a debate on something that is really important in society, um, such as, you know, the shaming of, um, of unmarried women in China, for example, right? Huge thing, tapping into that as a conversation, I mean, tapping into that and starting a conversation on that. But it can be just as, as 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 wonderful and simple as you know, um, bringing joy to people um, when they most need it, and um, and creating a piece of content um, that gets shared and shared and shared and talked about and talked about and talked about. So there is not like there is not one thing only. It's a range of topics. But what they all have is, and this is what I mean, right? They understand the larger cultural context and, um, and they tap into that because that helps them to be actually relevant to, to, a, to an audience that is bigger than the current buyers in the category, right? And it gets memorable, it gets talked about and picked up by the media or vice versa. Awesome. So we're running up on time, but I, w I know that this, this study is extensive. Mm -hmm. If folks want any more information or dive in deeper, how do you recommend that they do so? 
they can contact us. I mean, um, uh, webbershandwick.com, come right. to us or uh, contact me directly. That's and awesome. and um, that's good. Great. You know? We're going to yeah. drop that for you in the chat. And, and, I, and I guess what I would say is to the sort of whole community is we're happy to talk. Like, we're happy to talk, to collaborate, to, to give more information about how we've used this research so far. Yeah, the research, I mean, parts of it are on, um, on webofshandwick.com. So it, you click on that, you go to it, find it, and, um, and then we can start a conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Everybody, let's give it up for Joy and Nigel. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, folks, that's all that we have for today. We have a great episode lined up for you tomorrow. Alex Gianni, Executive Vice President of Content Production, will moderate a panel of three other production titans, and I'll sit down with Lo Harris, an artist, designer, and personality who has a ton of personality. You won't want to miss it, so I'll see you then.